Amorphophallus titanum, or the corpse flower, when it blooms, smells like, well, a corpse. And this strange plant has rooted itself into the story of this institution. It even made an appearance on last winter's Rose Parade float, commemorating our centennial. And it's been 21 years since we surprised the world with our first bloom. Okay, the first plant we got was just a stroke of good luck. There had been introduced to the U.S. a bunch of seed, and people who were really avid and active collectors had managed to get a few of the seed passed around. And um, Mark Dimmitt, who is a friend of ours from, who lives in Tucson, worked at the Arizona Sonoran Desert Museum. And Mark has, grew up here in Pastina and visits us a lot. But he had gotten one of these, interestingly, from the same source that I had tried to get seeds from. And by the time I ordered the seeds, it was a botanic garden in, in uh, Germany. Um, by the time I ordered the seeds, they were out of them, but Mark had gotten his order in sooner and got seeds and grew it. I've grown, well, I didn't know any of this at the time. I was driving, my family and I were driving through, back from the East Coast, we, we, we drive across the country yearly, and we were driving back, so we stopped off to see Mark at um, Arizona Sonoran Desert Museum, and while we were there, he said, oh, by the way, I've got an Amorphophallus titanum that I've been growing in my little greenhouse. And his greenhouse wasn't so little, but it had a low ceiling. It was a Quonset hut. He said, and it's getting so big, I can't really grow it in the Quonset hut anymore. Would you like it? And I said, absolutely, we would love one. And at that time, these, this one crop of seed that had come in with plants around the world had not, um, had not flowered yet. When he drove over to visit his mom, he brought us this um, bare root corn, which he had just, it was dormant, and he brought it to us. And we, we were really excited. It, a corn is like a gladiolus. It's an underground stem. It, it's not truly a bulb. A bulb has leaves. This is just a big, big, broad stem that has a growing tip and a place at the bottom that roots emerge. So we just had this 30 or 40 pound blob, this thing called a corn. And so we planted it. Right, and then it flowered within six months after we received it. Probably were pretty surprised. And were you directly involved at that point? Yes, I was. So that particular one, I had a visiting colleague um, from the Sydney Botanic Garden visiting. I think they had had one bloom, not much before that. And I showed it to him, and by then it was maybe, you know, might have been about 12, 18 inches tall. And he said, I think that's going to be a flower. What comes up doesn't look like a leaf. All of a sudden, it looks different. You're thinking, this is not a normal leaf. It takes a couple of days, and it took us more because we had never grown one before. So one of our volunteer, not, he was a volunteer at the time. No, he might have been a staff member. Uh, Brendan Crawwell was our plant recorder. And he's one of the he was a, uh, a young fellow in, in uh, going studying botany at PCC at the time, and one of the you know one of those sorts who really loves plants and likes all those weird plants. And so he saw, he saw I told him or he saw, I forget the whole sequence, but anyway, once he got wind of it, he went straight to communications and told them, and then that just unleashed the whole. <laughs> the whole thing. Local botanists are anxiously awaiting one of the rarest events in the world of horticulture, the blooming of a really stinky flower. But I believe what happened was that notice didn't get picked up by U.S. news agency, but it got picked up by a British, by BBC or someone, and that gave it some credibility or made it more interesting. Suddenly, we were barraged. You know, the Huntington is usually closed on Mondays, but because this is such an incredible event, tomorrow this place will be open to the public, so you'll be able to come, see, and smell. Um, and we treated it badly. We had it growing in the nursery, but we didn't have any place to show it for public to see, so we dragged it over to the dome in the sky. It wasn't even in a greenhouse. So the 99 bloom, I think what we did 
we just collected pollen and used it to self-pollinate, which at the time, it was, I had the idea to try it, and then John Traeger implemented it. He, he, he executed it. Um, at that point, I was the main person on staff who did much pollination, and uh, so I was called in to try to pollinate this thing, and it was a bit of a trick because we only had one. But the fact that it's actually an inflorescence and not just a fl one flower, uh, there's a whole bunch of flowers, males on top of the, the spadix and females below. Um, so there are actually dozens and dozens of flowers on one inflorescence. Uh, so I was able to extract some of the male flowers, uh, put them in a bag of rotting apples on the stovetop overnight, just to generate a little ethylene gas to help them open up and mature. And uh, the next morning, early the next morning, I pollinated. So that was self-pollination, which was the first time that uh, that had been attempted in this species, as far as we know. Um, I, I think over 100,000 people came during the two-week period. It was a very graceful plant. It took its time about flowering, and even after it flowered, it was still interesting, and we kept it on display for at least a month. Well, after a great deal of anticipation, fanfare, and celebration, the stinky corpse flower is taking its final bow. But then in 2000, Two. Now, I was away for the 2002 bloom. I missed it all completely. I was at a conference overseas. So John did the whole, John and Jim did the whole, that whole gig. And I guess they were made aware that there was one going to be blooming at UC Santa Barbara. So we were able to collect pollen from ours, get the pollen to them, which was going to be blooming right afterward. They pollinated theirs. They got all the seed, and then they gave us 100 seed back. And then we grew all that seed, and they all grew. And so many of the ones that we have now are the progeny, are the, those children from that 2002 Bloom. So the 2002, it was the same plant bloomed again. And again, because there was so little real horticultural experience at the time, the literature said, oh, they die after blooming. And the theory is that, you know, it uses up all the energy of the corm and then, then the corm just kind of withers away and doesn't recover. Well, that was wrong. So we have around 43 corpse flowers within the collection. And many of those came from the 2002 offspring. Um, on average, it can take around 16 to 18 years for a coarse flower from seed to actually bloom to reach, reach actually mature size. And they have to be moved and shoved around in these huge 25-gallon plastic pots, um, turned on their side when they go dormant, set back up when they start growing, uh, given space to turn out these massive single leaves such that people can still go in and take care of all the orchids. So we don't have a greenhouse just for Morphophallus titanum. That would be cool, but they just have to kind of live with the other plants, cohabitate somehow or another. Um, and because they reach mature size, because we have 43 in the collection, we think the frequency and the quantity of it blooming for us will be increasing over the years. The plants like these, these charismatic mega plants are like tigers. I think they will all be lost. Um, because we were one of the very first people, we took the initiative to propagate it, to pollinate it, to send the seeds off and send off seedlings to other botanic gardens. And our wish was that every botanic garden in the United States would have at least one. These living collections retain incredible value, but it's a different kind of value. The value we thought they had at one time was that we would hang on to these plants and reintroduce them into a native habitat when that habitat was available. I wonder if that's even possible now. Um, Morphophallus is just like the tiger. And, and so it's good that that one plant has acquired a, a following of many gardens that would like to keep a few alive. But for that one more for phallus, there's another 100,000 species of plant that aren't so charming or so interesting or so demanding. But they, there is an absolute association of this garden with that plant, which, which 
my feeling is we just need to continue to exploit to cause the rest of the garden and the rest of the plants to get as much um, airtime 